Hi, everybody. While we're here to continue our survey of some of the major theorists of religion, following the presentation in Daniel Powell's book, Nine Theories of Religion, our figure for today is the sociologist Max Weber. So let's dive in. Here we see Max Weber uh, depicted alongside a copy of his most famous book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Uh, we'll see that Weber represents a departure from the theorists we've been looking at recently. That includes Freud and Durkheim and Marx. Uh, like those figures, Weber is very much a social scientist, indeed one of the founders of the professional field of sociology alongside Durkheim, uh, but his approach leads to other departures in the study of religion and new emphases that bear a lot of fruit later on, as, as we'll see when we look at the later theorists. So let's have a closer look at this. We're starting with key contributions. What is Weber's key contribution? Well, this is uh, based on Powell's presentation and, and uh, also my reading of it, my interpretation of it. Well, he here's, what, here's what I have. Freud, Durkheim, and Marx are offering a functionalist view of religion. Remember what we said functionalism means. Religion serves a purpose. Religion performs a function. There's some material or social need that drives people to believe these strange superstitions, right? For Freud and Durkheim and Marx, in their, of course, very different ways, religion is only ever, as I have here on the slide, a mode of response to material conditions. It's a one-way track. Stuff is set up in a certain way in the world, and it leads people to believe these things. Weber takes a different approach. He proposes a two-way track. Yes, material conditions influence religious beliefs. Yeah, material conditions can even give rise to religious beliefs, as we'll see him suggest um, later on. We'll come back to that in the criticism section at the end. But here's the key. Religion also influences material conditions. Religion can influence the economy, how we organize society. Ideas have consequences, right? If you've ever heard the term big ideas, right? I'm, I'm going to study big ideas in college. That idea is not um, uniquely attributable to Weber, of course, but that interest in large kind of, we'll call them in a moment here, ideal types, right? How the big questions get addressed is something that Weber really helps us to start doing uh, in the way that we that we do it presently. Um, as Pals puts it, um, in relation to religion specifically, religion for Weber is neither always a cause nor always an effect. It might be either or both. Maybe my material conditions lead me to believe in God. Maybe my belief in God actually changes society and leads me to make different choices with respect to material things, to economic things specifically. So it's not a one-way street, it's a two-way street. That's the big takeaway I hope we can all keep in mind. Max Weber lived a remarkably short life uh, in, in some sense, and, and it's, it's sad. Um, however, his life was, was rich and exceptional in so many ways. He was born in 1864, died in 1920, and he grew up interacting with, as I have it here, some of the most prominent thinkers of the day in Germany. Uh, Weber's father was involved in politics and often to the Weber's home invited luminaries, you know, outstanding personalities in culture at the time. Weber thus not only was reading books by scholars um, active then, uh, he was actually meeting them. He was having dinner with them. He was chatting with them. And this led to um, him becoming a very intellectual child. As Pals puts it helpfully, he made little distinction between learning and leisure, right? Uh, I think he points out, pals, at one point that as a Christmas present for his parents, uh, Weber wrote an essay, right? It's a remarkable thing to do. Uh, so ideas and debate and research were things that were just part of his life in the most natural way from the very beginning. By 1895, um, he had completed his studies and he was a professor of political economy in Germany, a well-known rising star. People knew Weber's name. Would he go into politics? Would he continue doing work in academia? People were interested to know because he was admired as a thinker. 
Um, I have here the term unusual marriage and personal issues. Pals describes this in, in greater detail, of course. Uh, Weber seems to have had a troubled life in many ways, in some uh, way perhaps relating to his relationship with his father. Um, this led him to have uh, what we could call a, a nervous breakdown. He was unable to continue his duties in the university. Um, he retired from active life for some years uh, and then resumed as the editor of an influential journal. It turns out that a lot of his works later in his career were first published in this archive, uh, the long title in German, uh, but uh, he died um, amidst his labors and, and, and really at, at the peak of his intellectual um, ability at the age of 56. Uh, it's, of course, remarkable to put an entire life on one slide, uh, so I refer you to Pals' discussion for a, a fuller and perhaps more charitable characterization of this fascinating and consequential figure. There are three tools of sociology that uh, Pals identifies, and maybe not even sociology, of social science generally, right? Uh, social scientists use methods in the way artisans and, and craftspeople use tools. Uh, it, it's consequential uh, what tool you use, and the tool you use is going to affect the outcome of your work. Uh, we're going to highlight the three main tools that Weber used. The first of these is known as the Verstehen method. Verstehen. Uh, the word Verstehen uh, is simply the German word for understanding. Nothing mysterious there. It, it means understanding. Um, uh, Verstehen, um, as a method, um, holds that we cannot explain the actions of human beings in the same way as we can explain occurrences in nature. I have rocks, trees, apples. I have, perhaps, dogs and whales and cats. Um, all of these, and the animal case is more complex, but all of these um, do not have the same kind of conscious inward intentionality, we might say, as human beings seem to do. Again, the animal case is complex, and perhaps we'll have to have another lecture on that in some other context. Um, the point is there's a distinction between the human sciences and the natural sciences. The term in German for human sciences is Geisteswissenschaften. Uh, Wissenschaft means science, and Geist means spirit or mind. So the Geisteswissenschaft, N, Geisteswissenschaften, is, is the plural for the human sciences, the sciences focused on, on human beings. Um, Naturwissenschaften, nature meaning nature, <laughs> Wissenschaft, science, so it's the natural sciences. So there's a key distinction at this time that, that emerges in the work of Weber and other thinkers, and some of them depicted here on the slide, Vindelbond and, and Diltai, between the human sciences and the natural sciences. While the natural sciences, which have enormous prestige at the very beginning of the 20th century, can be used to explain all natural occurrences, to study human beings is different. This is what Weber and Windelband and Diltai and, and others held. Uh, this led to a, a controversy known in German as the Methodenstreit, uh, the dispute about methods. Streit means a dispute or struggle. Uh, so the dispute was, do we need a different method to study human beings than we do to study stuff? And that's the point I would invite you to latch upon, right? That's the point that makes this old German debate about scientific method, I think, very timely. Um, to understand human action, do we need something special? Or can human beings be explained in the very same way as anything else in the world? Um, this is a, a live debate today um, in, of course, uh, different contexts with different vocabularies. Uh, but I would invite you to look for it and to consider that question for yourself. As Pals writes here, with respect to this Verstehen method, the method of trying to understand human action, um, as it were, from the inside, he writes, Verstehen is thus a form of science 
a systematic, rational method of accounting for human actions by discerning the role of motives or meanings where they figure as causes. So sometimes our actions are caused not only by physical stimuli outside of ourselves, like you know, the pool ball, one knocks the other, and that's just simple, natural causation. In the case of human beings, because we have this inwardness about ourselves, this self-consciousness, motives and meanings can actually drive action. If you want to understand human beings, you need not only to understand material conditions, but also to understand what drives them in terms of their ideas. A second, uh, nice picture, right? A second tool uh, is what uh, Weber calls ideal types, in German, ideal typus. Um, he works with ideal types. What is an ideal type? An ideal type is not a generalization. So we're not taking a bunch of stuff and just figuring out what's the, what's the least common denominator, what's the, the common basis of these different instances of similar phenomena. We're rather engaging in purposeful exaggeration. We're trying to come up with a maximal outline of a thing. We want to emphasize all of the features that really make it distinct, that define it as a concept, right? So Weber uses this across his thought. The, the example in the kind of bombastic image on the screen here is a king, right? It's almost a caricature, right? What What is a king? Well, a king has lands, a king has power, a king has a crown, a king has a robe. Uh, it, there are certain things that we associate with kings. Those are superficial examples, of course. Um, but what Weber thinks is we can, in speaking about not only a king, but an artisan or a merchant, uh, a revolution, uh, democracy, uh, capitalism, uh, these are terms that we can form this, this kind of ideal conception of them and then use that as a standard for comparing different instances of what seemed to be that thing across different cultures. So in a way here, he's solving the problem that we were introduced to in our discussion of Tyler and Fraser, the problem of cross-cultural comparison. Because uh, Weber, like Tyler and Fraser, are dr is drawing on a wide variety of cultures. How can he justify doing that? He does so through the device of these ideal types. Um, as Pals puts it, an ideal type furnishes a conceptual framework, furnishes means gives us, into which all cases can be brought for analysis. So I have case, 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 many different cases, but I'm going to bring all those together and say, okay, I'm stipulating, I'm stipulating, I'm just going to say that a king means this, A, B, C, D. These are the features of king, right? How does king one compare to that? How does king two compare to that. So again, this is a question about method. How can we work with this you know, enormously complex field of phenomena in the world and derive um, knowledge about it? The third um, tool uh, highlighted by PALS, um, quite rightly in relation to Weber's work, concerns values. Weber has strong opinions about values. For Max Weber, values have no place in science, in science properly so-called, right? Um, science should be a value-free endeavor. Right? If I'm observing, let's take the natural sciences, I'm observing something, I'm measuring something, I'm, I'm determining what is the causal, natural causal relationship between thing A and thing B, right? It doesn't matter if I like thing A or thing B, or if I would prefer it to be one way or the other way, if there were a scientist who was letting her personal preferences, her value judgments, determine the outcomes of her science, we would be concerned about that. That's not how science is done. Well, we get that intuition from many places, but one of them is the work of Max Weber. For Weber, facts and values are strictly distinct things, and scientists are to work with facts. As Pals puts it, the purpose of science is to describe things as they are and not to promote personal views on what ought to be. This applies to the task of lecturers and professors in the classroom, right? For Weber, when a person is speaking, he, he has this in uh, his essay, Science as a Vocation, which is a fabulous essay, um, 
when a lecturer is, is speaking, it's not for him or her to simply tell you what they personally think. I mean, there might be moments where they say, and, and my judgment on this is as follows, and I'm going to give you my reasons and let you consider what you think about it. Um, but for the most part, they are there to convey to you what is the case about that thing and to identify places where value judgments are maybe entering into it on their own part or, or anyone else. But again, distinct, distinct. Um, the example here, and so I was looking for a picture for this slide, Pals gives us this great illustration, the Luddites. Um, you may have heard this term, the Luddites. Um, this is a movement in 19th century England of uh, people, often uh, in many cases uh, workers in uh, textile factories, who complained that the owners of those factories were introducing machines uh, that would replace them. <laughs> this is certainly something that we can uh, relate to our contemporary experience. Think about Amazon replacing uh, human workers with, with robots or or machines. Um, these Luddites, and the term Luddite comes from a particular person in England named Ned Ludd, who, who was apparently one of the leaders uh, early on of this group. Uh, these Luddites um, uh, opposed uh, the introduction of machines. And here's the interesting thing I want to share. I, I think it's just a delicious little, little side note. Um, so the Luddites uh, actually uh, threw uh, their shoes uh, into the uh, gears of the machine. Uh, and and in, uh, in the Netherlands, because it was also you know, around Europe, the movement kind of spread, um, these shoes were called sabot, uh, S-A-B-O-T, uh, or in plural, S-A-B-O-T-S. And so we get our word sabotage <laughs> from this act of people who oppose machines in factories throwing their sabot, their shoes, into the gears of the machine to stop up the machine and, you know, uh, prevent the capitalist from, from taking their jobs by replacing them with machines. So they were the original saboteurs. Uh, in any case, if you are studying the Luddites, you might say, if you're a Marxist historian who is in favor of the working class winning rights against the capitalists, this was a prophetic action that foresaw the greed of the capitalists that would wreak such havoc in the lives of workers across Europe. If you are looking at it as a capitalist, a kind of advocate of, of the free market and increased technology and, and so forth, um, you might say, these Luddites, are, it, it, they're unfortunate. You know, they're deluded. It's sad. They don't realize the benefits that these machines can have for them. In that case, you have an example of two different interpretations of the historical facts about the Luddites with their sabot and, and all of this, right? Um, and those different interpretations are driven by the, the values of those two authors. Uh, what Weber would say is that in both cases, the author needs to be clear about her values and take care that those values don't shape her analysis uh, in such a way as to as to privilege it, privilege one side or the other, or to suppose that only one interpretation could be acceptable. We're gonna have just a few slides now on the key, the key, the central thing about Weber's presentation. Um, we have some primary source selections from this assigned this week as well. His book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Um, in this book, Weber employs all three of the methods we've looked at, the Verstehen method, the use of ideal types, and the focus on the relation between facts and values. Uh, the book was published between 1904 and 5, and Pals gives us a really nice pithy characterization of what it does. The book claims there is a close connection between religion, the rise of economic capitalism, and the birth of modern civilization in Western Europe. Um, we, can, we can make it even pithier. Uh, capitalism comes from religion. We think that capitalism emerges because of uh, social conditions and classes and, and groups here and there struggling for their interests. Yeah, that's part of it. But Weber is suggesting that what really drove capitalism from the inside, for Stehen, looking at the motives, right, is the spirit of capitalism. And that, he thinks, came from religion. So sure, 
all of the kind of details about how it unfolded can be explained in various ways. But to really understand why capitalism arose, where it did, when it did, how it did, you got to see how it's connected to Protestant Christianity. Um, it starts from a question, the book, a very simple question. Why is it that Protestants are so much better represented than Catholics among business leaders? Business leaders in Weber's time were Protestants, by and large. Uh, it was rare to find a really, you know, entrepreneurial, uh, efficient, industrially minded Catholic. Um, how come? Weber tries to explain. He focuses especially on two figures, Martin Luther and John Calvin. These are two uh, luminaries of the Protestant Reformation um, in the 16th century, that is the, in the 1500s. Martin Luther in 1517 nails his theses, his famous 95 theses to the door of the cathedral in, in Wittenberg, uh, or at least that's, that's the story that we have received. Um, Martin Luther, Weber says, secularized the idea of vocation. Well, let's explain that a little bit. If I have a vocation until 1950s or 60s, this had one meaning. I'm going to be a priest or I'm going to be a nun, right? I'm going to enter religious life. If I have a vocation, I enter religious life. If I don't have a vocation, I get a job, you know, start a business, live my life in, in the world. Um, in Latin, the word for world is seculum, uh, and therefore we get the word secularized, right? So the secular world is the world that is not religious, secular versus religious. Okay, so Martin Luther took this idea that you have a vocation, right? I am called to a higher life. I am called to be a priest, to be a nun. And he secularized it. He took this intensity, energy, devotion that was characteristic of priests and nuns, very committed to their faith, right? They're going to devote their whole life to it 24-7. Um, and they, they took this idea of vocation, and th th not they, this idea of vocation was taken, right, and uh, applied to secular uh, callings. So now, instead of being only, you know, utterly devoted 24-7 to my practice as a priest or a nun or a monk, I'm going to be utterly devoted 24-7 to my business, to improving things in the world, right? There's this kind of intensity of commitment that's not just, you know, going through life, uh, getting, getting this or that little benefit here and there, but I have a mission I have a passion, right? We say today, what is your passion? Well, that idea that you can take a, a kind of a transcendent passion, something that drives your whole life, and use it to advance causes in the world, that would be a secularized notion of vocation. So um, he points out, Weber, um, that Protestant life was marked by habits of discipline, thrift, simplicity, and self-denial, all of these being habits that also marked the monastery, right? That marked where the monks lived. You would go there because you didn't want to just lounge around and drink wine and enjoy the sunset, right? You went there because you wanted to achieve salvation. And that leads us to our second thinker, John Calvin. Now, John Calvin um, taught, like some other thinkers in the Christian tradition before him, a doctrine called predestination. This is a this is a, well, I'll call it a frightful doctrine. That's an injection of my value into this discussion, okay? It's frightful. What it is, um, you are predestined to salvation or damnation. You're going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. And it's been decided in advance. There's nothing you can do about it. Nothing you do makes any difference to it, right? You're either one of the elect or as Pals points out, one of the reprobate, right? God decided it before you were born. Hmm, that's scary, right? So how do you deal with that? Um, for people who were readers of, of John Calvin's work, and this guy was not some marginal thinker, he was one of the defining figures of the age, um, people who received this doctrine of predestination said, well, which one am I? 
Am I one of the elect or not? Uh, and it caused, as, as Pals puts it here, an intense anguish about their eternal fate. Like, man, this has already been decided. How am I going to know? Well, you can't know because only God knows. What are you going to do? Well, you darn well better act like one of the elect, right? <laughs> you darn well better uh, do everything that a person who is saved would do. Um, so uh, this, alongside this secularized idea of vocation from Luther that we talked about, um, Weber thinks drives capitalism because now, okay, I have a business, right? I get rich off my business. What am I going to do? I'm going to buy a golden yacht. Yeah, No, that's what someone would do if they were damned because we know that golden yachts are exorbitant and bad and in some way probably sinful, right? So what I'm going to do is practice self-denial. I'm not going to spend my money. I'm going to reinvest my money in the business. In fact, I'm going to live like, uh, who, who's this guy? Um, Warren Buffett. I'm going to live like Warren Buffett, right? I'm not going to spend my money much at all. I'm going to live a very simple life, um, but I'm going to be damn rich, right? And I'm going to use that wealth to create more wealth. So this willingness to practice self-denial, Weber thinks, comes from that secularized Protestant idea of vocation and from this fear that I might not be one of the elect. So I want to act like one of the elect to kind of I can't, but earn my spot, right? To convince at least myself, give myself the security of thinking that I am chosen. Luther's and Calvin's ideas led to, as, as Weber puts it in Powell's quotes, an inner worldly asceticism, right? The world, the economy, your business, politics, all of these things became not just a kind of, you know, everyday practice that you do when the really important thing is church, they became the really important thing. You work out your salvation in your business, not just in the church. And in fact, ultimately, not in the church at all. That's kind of <laughs> that's the direction we've gone in. Um, as Pals puts it, the pursuit of wealth acquired a new moral status. What was once a vice now became a virtue, right? Uh, money. God and money. Right? You cannot serve both God and mammon, uh, it says in the Bible. You cannot serve both God and money. Um, there's a long-standing suspicion about riches. You know, the, the, it is uh, difficult for the rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven, paraphrasing Christ in the Gospels. But now, all of a sudden, we have very often privately devoted Protestant Christians, right, working tirelessly in their vocation, their business, to build wealth. Um, but it's justified, in their view, because they're not, again, spending the money on themselves. They're reinvesting it. They're creating good for the community. This drives capitalism, right? I'm reinvesting. I'm building up capital. I'm building up equity in the business. Uh, this view, Weber argues, replaces the, quote, otherworldly asceticism of the medieval church, which idealized withdrawal from the world to the convent or the monastery. Old view, if I'm really religious, go to the convent or the monastery, become a nun or a priest or a monk, right? New view, if I'm really religious, devote yourself to worldly, uh, profitable activity. Right? And, and so we see in Puritanism and a lot of movements that follow the, the Protestant Reformation, this dynamic, according to Max Weber. Two quotes from Pals that I think will kind of cinch this, and then we're going to move on to some other stuff in Weber. Modern capitalism, Pals writes, is not the everyday greed of all people and places. Modern capitalism is a distinct and different phenomenon that first appeared in one place, Western Europe and for historical reasons specific to the faith and values of Protestantism. We have capitalism today. Why did capitalism arise? When it did, where it did, how it did. There is an answer to the question. Weber says it's Protestant Christianity. That dynamic and specific features of it drove the emergence of this new social form, right? Didn't happen in other parts of the world. It's not good, it's not bad doesn't matter right, in a value sense. It's just descriptively the case that what we call capitalism seems to have emerged only in this one time and place and, and from there spread well, everywhere. Next passage from Pals. 
the new religious ideas and behaviors of Protestantism usher in a reversal of attitudes toward acquiring wealth. And from that reversal has come the culture of commerce, markets, capitalism that defines Western civilization as we know it today. You want to be an entrepreneur? Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Well, you want to make money. Is that because you're greedy? Well, no, you want to help your community. You want to do good. You want to practice you know, self-discipline to achieve a goal. You regard this as one of the most important things that you can do. You really value your work, right? If you're doing all of those things, according to Max Weber, maybe you're not a Protestant Christian. We, we've forgotten all of that for the most part, right? But the dynamic remains and the passion that people show in building businesses and, and the meaning that is invested in that today. Um, just look at, I don't know, anything in our culture. It's all over it, uh, is, is explicable because of this background uh, in religion. Weber wrote extensively on religion and not only about Protestant Christianity. Um, this is a copy of his book here, The Sociology of Religion. Um, this, was this was originally published as a book-length chapter in another work uh, of his, Economy and Society, a huge work. That was published in 1922. Remember, he died in 1920. It came out after his death. Um, in this book, um, he leads into what was going to be his magnum opus, his great work, right? Uh, it was going to look at all of the religions of the world and kind of do what he had done with the Protestant ethic book, you know, kind of analyze how religion had interacted with the economy, but do it for all religions. So he started with the religions of China, moved on to India, moved on to ancient Judaism in the years indicated, and then he died. So he was unable to complete this work. Um, but we can see the trajectory that we, he was on and, and kind of anticipate where he would have gone with it. What I want to do in, in the remaining slides, and then we'll get to the kind of analysis and criticism at the end, is uh, just select from Powell's kind of extensive discussion of this, a few memorable and I think especially important um, typologies, uh, ideas uh, that are contained in Weber's writings on religion beyond the Protestant ethic book. Um, the first of these is the typology of religious leaders uh, that he provides. Um, he identifies three types of religious leaders. So we're back with the ideal types, right? And no single religious leader is going to fit only exclusively one of these types. There's always going to be kind of overlap in any individual case. But Weber sees these as three kind of logically distinct possibilities uh, for uh, the, the, the nature of uh, a religious leader's work. Uh, the first of these is, the, well, the three are magician, priest, and prophet. Okay, magician, right? This figure is, I have on the slide here, a charismatic leader. This person has a gift, right? That enables them to put people beyond the realm of everyday activity and disclose to them another level of reality. For Weber, as Pals points out, it's not the case that magicians were in the past and now we're all, you know, logical, rational people and therefore we don't believe in magic and there are no more magicians. I mean, entertainers, politicians very often, influencers of various kinds could be described by Weber as magicians, right? They have this kind of charisma, this energy. Uh, there are certain spiritual teachers today, I, I, I mean, to name a name, well, I won't name names, I don't want to call anybody out, um, but uh, you see this, this trend uh, in, in many religious leaders, that people, people look to them as kind of guru figure, right? Um, a second type is the priest, quite different from the first, right? They're both religious leaders, but the priest um, as a type um, he or she does not have necessarily any charisma at all, any magnetism. They might be incredibly boring, in fact, right? However, um, what uh, gives them their authority is their connection with the institution. They have been ordained, right? And so you listen to them because they represent that institution, not because they are personally inspiring. The third type is the one that Weber emphasizes the most, and this is the type of the prophet. 
Um, he defines this person, uh, this figure, um, famously as a purely individual bearer of charisma, right? So this is not a person who is claiming to kind of be in touch with uh, cosmic forces, and they might have a relation to what they call a god, uh, which could be important, um, but they're a person who calls out injustice, speaks with a kind of personal authority. Um, this is the sense in which in Islam, for example, Jesus of Nazareth is called a, a prophet, right? He spoke to the people as with authority, not like the scholars and, and teachers of the time. Um, this authority is anchored in, as Pals puts it, the revolutionary power of his personality and his message. Uh, so uh, this is a person who can inspire people on a large scale, start movements. I have a picture of Mohandas Gandhi on the slide, of course, right? He could be seen as a prophetic leader, also with the dimension of the magician, uh, also perhaps with the dimension of the priest. I mean, they're all mixed in, right? Um, insofar as um, Gandhi or any religious leader is a, a prophet, um, this means one of two things for Weber, um, either an exemplary prophet, in the case that the person lives a life that is an example to other people, right? So, I mean, Gandhi lived the kind of simple life that he was calling on people to live to oppose British colonial rule, um, or an ethical prophet. And this is someone like Isaiah or Ezekiel or Amos in the Hebrew scriptures, what Christians call the Old Testament, who stood up against injustices of their time and called for repentance on the part of people committing those injustices. So these three types, again, they overlap each other and they interweave, but Weber thinks they are distinct and it is useful to distinguish them. What happens when a charismatic leader dies? It's an interesting question. Um, Jesus Christ, let's choose an example. So Jesus certainly had a personal magnetism of a kind. I mean, Christians believe that he performed miracles, people followed him around. He was a really important leader. Uh, and then he, he died. We leave it there for our purposes. Um, what happens? Well, his authority, uh, his or her authority, is, as, as Weber puts it, routinized. Routinized. Um, a routine is developed uh, around the memory of or the authority of that figure. Pals writes, um, routinization here refers to the transformation of the prophet's inspirational gift into something permanent, fixed in the bureaucracy of an institution, right? Okay, so you have a prophet, she's charismatic, everyone's inspired by her, and then she dies, unfortunately. Well, you know, her individual charisma is no longer available. But, you know, her memory and the community that she formed, well, those are still there. So the, um, the, the priestly class, going back to our types, establishes a kind of infrastructure, a kind of process, a ritual around um, the example or the, the person of that charismatic figure, right? And, and thus, in this weird way, as Pell puts it, the priestly bureaucracy, by nature opposed to the unpredictable inspirations of prophecy, can become the prophet's best ally after his death. So while the prophet was alive, all of these kind of, you know, priestly functionaries were saying, oh, that's not what it says in the book, or uh, you, you, have, you can't do it that way, you're breaking the rules, right? But then the person dies, and the priests are like, Okay, let's make some rules, <laughs> right? Uh, I have a picture on the slide of, of St. Paul. I, I, I hope it's fair to St. Paul, but he's often cited, um, and I think rightly, as a person who routinized the charisma of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, right? Um, Jesus Christ, charismatic figure, dies. We need something. We need something to carry on the practice. We call this the church today, right? The community of Christian believers. Um, but Paul was really instrumental in bringing about the religion that we call Christianity. Just a few more here. Um, I want to touch on this idea of disenchantment. Weber's really well known for this. Um, when he's looking at the whole sweep of historical development, one thing he focuses on is how previously, kind of previous to the modern period, um, people regarded the world as enchanted in some way. There were supernatural, magical things, right? enchanted brooks and trees and saints and spirits everywhere. Um, you could connect with these, with these 
uh, dimensions of reality with these beings through different kinds of rituals or practices, right? Um, however, he thinks, with the Protestant Reformation, with the emergence of modernity, with the spread of capitalism and natural sciences, this sense that the world is enchanted or magical has been lost. Um, he calls this process disenchantment, um, or in German, Entzauberung. Uh, the reason I give you the German is it's instructive. Ent means to remove as a prefix, and Zauber refers to magic. So Entzauberung literally means removing the magic from the world. I googled depressing factory and found this picture, right? So the world, which looks, you know, beautiful and green and luscious and so many places, um, has been turned in the modern world into something that is merely functional. It, you know, no magic here. Um, what Weber thinks is that this amounts to a removal of the supernatural support system, right, that was constituted of relics. I'm going to go on a pilgrimage. Right? I'm going to purchase an indulgence and be released from my sins. Uh, I'm going to, you know, invest in this beautiful stained glass that will elevate my spirit. All of this comes to be seen as so much kind of poetry and romanticism and, you know, soft personal preferences um, and not serious, hard-nosed kind of, kind of science. Um, so the world is left without supernatural meaning. There's a lot of debate about this and discussion, you know, should there be a kind of re-enchantment of the world? Can we ever actually like go back to this supernatural support system? Should we want to? Is the world really so disenchanted as Weber says it is? All things for your consideration. One more of these um, themes, and then we're going to wrap up with the analysis and, and conclusion. So um, Weber points out two what he calls salvation programs or programs of salvation. A program is how you get somewhere, right? Like a program at, a, at an event or a play or something. Um, all religions, he thinks, mix these two elements, but this is one final example of his idea of the ideal type, right? So there are two ideal types of how people achieve salvation. One is through your own effort. The other is as a gift. Some people think that you can achieve salvation by working real hard. Right? You're going to engage in ritualized action. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to pray. I'm going to kneel down and engage in this or that activity. I'm going to be a spiritual virtuoso. I'm going to be a hero devoted to spiritual perfection. Right? doesn't matter if it's in a monastery or in my business. Um, I'm going to and so achieve salvation here can mean, in a religious sense, go to heaven. It can also mean, in a secular sense, you know, achieve renown and do great good in my line of work, in my business, right? So whatever passion is driving us, whatever constitutes salvation in our mind, could be framed in this way. Um, a second is salvation as a gift, right? We can't do anything on our own to achieve salvation. We need to look to a savior. We need to look to Jesus Christ. In, in, in the Buddhist tradition, maybe we need to look to the Buddha or a bodhisattva, that is an enlightened being who can help us along in the way toward enlightenment. Um, this is a different approach entirely and leads to a totally different kind of spirituality. So Weber's not saying that, you know, all, you know, half of the world is one way and half of the world is the other way. He's saying if you're trying to analyze different religious traditions as a social scientist, you can use these tools, these ideal types, to kind of compare and see across cultures how uh, different practices are to be assessed. Last two slides here, analysis and conclusion. Um, for Weber, and uh, two comparisons, Weber and Durkheim, Weber and Marx. Um, so like Durkheim, Weber's really into religion. You've seen that, right? And that's not just because this is a lecture about Weber and religion, like he really was into religion. Um, he helped to establish sociology as a field, made it a kind of you know known professional um, uh, area of study. But while Durkheim is focusing on one single culture and then deriving lots of conclusions from that, Weber is starting from a kind of a big question, so like the Protestant ethic book, right? Like, uh, why is it that more Protestants than Catholics are business leaders? Let's explain this question. And then he looks across many different cultural contexts and the works of many different people, not just in material culture, but in ideas, as we saw, right? And tries to explain and give an answer to that question. In the second case, Weber and Marx 
we can say that Weber is more cautious than Marx about explaining religion in just one way. Like for Karl Marx, as we as we saw last week, religion is a result of exploitation. There are rich people, there are poor people, and the rich people want to keep the poor people from rebelling against them. So they tell the poor people they're supposed to be poor because God wants them that way. That's pretty short summary, but there you have it. Um, for Weber, it's never that easy. We're back to where we started, right? It's not just a one-way street, it's a two-way street. Ideas influence uh, economy, but the economy also, as Marx emphasizes, influence ideas. Um, so that's a difference with Marx that's really important. Some criticisms of Weber. Um, uh, Pals helpfully points out that Weber's ideas have been roundly criticized by everyone all the time, <laughs> a lot. Um, and that's in a way, as he rightly says, not evidence that the ideas are weak or bad. It's actually evidence that they're really interesting and important, right? They're getting at something. People are responding to them passionately um, because they're important and they, and they expose things that usually are not exposed. At, at least that seems to be Pal's opinion and certainly it's mine. Um, some criticisms that have been made of Weber include um, a focus on his consistency. We've talked about this two-way street thing, and it sounds very nice, but, you know, is he always really uh, uh, rigorous about that? Does he sometimes not only say that economy kind of influences religion, but does he allow sometimes that economy makes religion? And Pals gives an example or two of this, and Marxists or others might say, well, Weber's not being consistent in his method. The second criticism concerns social science and, and religion more broadly. And here we're kind of back to the criticism that we had of Tyler and Frazier, right? Yeah, Weber has these ideal types, and so he's using them to make cross-cultural comparisons. Um, however, can you really do that? I mean, there are so many different cultures. And we saw he talks about China and India and ancient Judaism and Christianity. Um, how much, as a scientist... Can you skip across cultures in that way and still have like test, you know, testable hypotheses? Can you really find patterns or categories that are going to be applied to all of those cases? China, India, Israel, Europe. I mean, that, that's, that's something that needs to be uh, debated still, um, but it's a frequent criticism of, of Weber's work. All right, what do we have here? Here. And there, friends, is our discussion of the great sociologist Max Weber, an important contributor to our big debates and big ideas today. Thank you for your attention.